So you've got people coming in where, uh, you know, this is this is a big step for their family. Right. Right. And they're right. they're they're trusting me to tell them what they really need, not try to just sell them something. Right. But they don't really know what they need. And so they don't have the <laughs> language. They don't have the, they, 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 they all they know is they don't have this thing. And it's like, well, you know, and you start out with. Well, how much RAM do you need? And how much hard drive do you need? And you start, and they're like, I don't even know what those words mean. So this is the difference between what I call supply side language and demand side language. How do you apply jobs to be done to sales? We've got Bob Mesta back on the show to talk to us about that today. Let's get into it. How's it going, folks? Welcome back to the show. Really excited uh, to have Bob Mesta back on uh, to talk to us about how we can take jobs to be done and apply that to sales uh, in what he calls demand side sales. So I've got I've got my my good friend David uh, with me. David, how you doing? What's up, Devin? Man, every time you play that music and then your voice comes on, man, it's yeah. like a little head bob. Like, <laughs> that, always, that always gets me like centered back on what we're doing right here. So I'm I'm excited about that, but I'm probably a little more excited about Bob being on. Sorry, dude. So, yeah, yeah, no, man. I, uh, the 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 theme music is specifically designed to produce that effect in That's whoever is listening. <laughs> How you doing, Bob? Thanks so Good. much for being hey, back Devin. on. Hey, David. Thanks for having me back. Excited, oh, excited to share more. Whatever I can do. Always, man. Uh, always uh, really glad to, to be able to glean wisdom from you. Um, uh, obviously, uh, you know, I've been heavily impacted uh, by, by your work. Uh, and uh, I've talked about I've talked about demand side sales before, uh, mm -hmm. but I really wanted to give people a deep dive because I feel like there is uh, there's a there's a mentality kind of that that uh, sales uh, is it has to be sales has to be winner take all sales has to be you know uh uh you know we talk about we talk about uh uh win-win uh scenarios but still uh for as many good sales people as there are out there everybody uh, uh that is not acquainted with sales seems to equate sales to somebody trying to get one over on you and uh -huh. i love your approach to sales uh -huh. i love the way you wrote about it in demand side sales 101 and I wanted to be able to, to, to bring you back on to, to let's have a conversation about uh, applying jobs to be done to the sales process, which is something that I'm sure a lot of people uh, really haven't thought about. But you uh, do a great job well, of thinking about that. And I don't know if a lot of people know that you have a background in sales. Well, yeah. So my, my, my background actually starts as an engineer and I've always wanted to build things. But I learned very quickly that if I couldn't sell my ideas to somebody or, or I couldn't figure out how to help them see what I was trying to do. The fact that the progress I could help them make, the, the fact is, is like it, it didn't work. And so part of this is I had to learn how to sell, if you will, very, very early, because at some point in time, you, you, you have to find fit, right? I think at the same time, the fact is that I've done seven startups and in the startups, the hardest part of any of the startups I've ever done is sales. And yet there's no sales professors <laughs> or at least uh, back in the day that we're not there. There are some now, but the fact is, for the most part, they give you no training in sales. They give you how to do a, you know, a balance sheet, how to do, you know, a P and L, how to do, you know, a marketing plan, all these other things. But nobody's there to teach you about sales. And so, to me, part of the re reason I wrote the book is the way I learned how to sell was actually through jobs to be done, which is how do I just help people understand the progress they're trying to make and make sure that my product can help them do that. It's that simple. Nice. Right? I mean. That's awesome. I, and, and that is uh, that's really the the shift in focus that I want to, to try to help people have and, and to realize it is actually a shift in focus uh, for many to, sh to yeah. shift from uh, thinking about how to sell something versus how to help somebody make progress. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, what's interesting, so I, I, I really wrestled with the name because I, I wanted to call it the demand side buying because that's really you know, customers buy and we sell. And so sales is really a supply side concept. 
and buying is a demand side concept. And so part of this is, is you know, the, the, the tagline is, uh, you know, stop selling and help your customers make progress. And ultimately, that's that's what we're trying to really do. And, and so in a lot of cases, what you realize is how training has the training around sales has become about how do you find somebody's problem and then just, you know, basically then make our our solution fit that problem as opposed to what progress are they really trying to make and can we actually help them make it? And they're very different kind of questions. And you start to realize that people are trained differently around it. And, and ultimately, there's a lot of people who sell who don't even know they sell. Like a, a, you know, a doctor or a nurse, they actually sell a patient on a rehab program. And a teacher sells a student on a lesson, but the, the student has to make the progress. And so part of this is to actually kind of flip that whole notion of we're not actually trying to convince people to do anything. They convince themselves. How do you actually help understand what they're trying to do and get in their way. That is uh, that is amazing. Uh, the the uh, you hit, you said something really really great there. Is you're, you're really trying to uh, help them convince themselves, right? Yeah. And, and that is uh, it's a huge it's a huge difference there. You also talk about uh, not trying to just convince them that your solution is the is the best regardless of whatever they said to you before that whatever regardless well, of whatever you under you know uncovered the problem to be you, you've kind of already started even before you asked the question with my solution is the solution exactly right. regardless of whatever <laughs> they right. say that's right <laughs> well and and I, I think that that you know good salespeople like the, the interesting part is when you ask people about tell me about the best sales experience you've ever had and the worst sales experience you ever had and when you actually pull that apart, when you talk to the people about their best salesperson, they never call them a salesperson. It's almost like they were a concierge or they, they just helped me, they helped me figure out what I wanted. And, and you start to realize like, and you say, well, so they were a good salesperson. Oh, no, no, they're not a salesperson. Like they, uh, it's like because it has such a derogatory nature to it that they pull away from it. And, and then when they have a horrible sales experience, all they talk about is how crappy the salesperson was. Right. They didn't know the product. They didn't listen to me. They didn't do that. And you're, you start to realize like, okay, it's, it's by its very nature, it has a negative connotation. And so to me, it was, it was really about how do we actually flip this lens? And what, what's interesting is, so uh, um, the Kellogg School at Northwestern, they just picked up uh, in the, they have a, a, the Sales Institute and they picked this up as the foundational book for their, the whole program for them. And the whole notion is, is that Again, most of the time sales is taught about as techniques and product and, and, and psychology, but the foundation is really about how do people buy? And that what most people don't do is they don't actually design the sales process to help people buy. They design the sales process to make it more predictable for finance. So I always think that the sales process, when you really look, look at it and you dive deep into it, it's not actually usually run by sales, it's run by marketing and finance. And the way I came to that conclusion was, when can you actually offer a discount? Only at the end of the quarter, because finance has screwed up the prediction and that we're actually, or somehow there's something that happened and they don't want to explain the difference. So they're willing to give a 20% discount before the end of the quarter so they don't have to go explain to the, to the investors why they didn't make the numbers. And I'm like, okay, this is just bad behavior because I could have sold it for, I could have sold it for full price three days after the end of the quarter, but that's not how they think. That's so true. Yeah, man, I, I know. Sorry, sorry, what, but that's what, no, no. What, what's so funny about that is how quickly, uh, you know, you mentioned having done a bunch of startups and like how quickly teams, even small teams that don't even have some of the, you know, big co problems of our, right, we've got a, yeah. you know, shareholders and stuff. Like how quickly we we sort of still regress to the mean around. Yes. Okay, you know, I mean, De Devin called out earlier where you know it's like you're having a conversation. You just started the company. You 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 actually you you clearly understand the problem set. You clearly understand the progress is trying to be made. Yeah. And still, it's almost like there's a switch in any human that thinks they're in sales right. to immediately regress to the yeah. But I I just told my boss that we would sell four of these, so I'm gonna go ahead and push. You know? yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah, gonna right. go ahead and say right. they, like these next ten words that come out of my mouth. They're I'm I'm still gonna go ahead and say those. It doesn't yeah. matter that I know. The, so yeah, yeah. It, it's funny and, how quickly we regress. And we to do that, need right? we do need we do need to actually have some predictability but the fact is is that if you start to look at where the power is and where you basically how you make decisions and how quickly we just switch salespeople out 
right? We don't, we don't actually, we think salespeople are all about the, 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 the people who understand like who's got the most connections and who can actually, you know, kind of make the most calls. And, and ultimately there's a lot of that, but the thing is, is the best salespeople know how to respect people and, and understand that their no doesn't mean no for now or no forever. It means no for now that they don't have the right context wrapped around them to actually value what we do. And so part of this is to realize at some point the, the pushing actually is how we end up getting distorted. Um, you know, we distort the product and that's how we end up getting bad clients. And we end up getting clients who don't, you know, they, you know, the, I always say the, the, the bottom 20% of our clients actually cost us probably the, the, you know, 80% of, of, of our, our, our costs because we end up, shouldn't have sold them. And we end up having to bend the business to fit those 20 bottom 20%. Man, right? that is amazing. Is that, <laughs> do, you, do you agree or like, is that not true? I, I Listen, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think that um, the, the trick, and, and you know this, like the, the trick is always in, you know, and in, in, in you said it, having individuals that, can, that, that have the framework either internally, externally yeah. or otherwise, right? Yeah, implicit the or explicit. To be able to right. identify yep. that, hey, this is, this is not the right fit for us and, or it's not the right fit for them. Like we are right. not the right fit for them and being willing to back up for a second. And, you know, it doesn't mean no forever, like you said, but right. to, to pause for a second and say, Hey, listen, this is not like, like this is not go time with these folks right so, now. So, uh, there, there needs to be a but, pause. But this is the thing is, is that, that again, I'm just going to give you a little subtle difference. One, the usual thing you say, well, I'll call you back in a month just to check in to see if any, you know, if there's anything that's yep. changed. And what I usually say and what I teach the, the people that I, I'm teaching this to is they like tell them the three things that have to happen to them that yeah. say today's like. So if you actually have another project fail and the fact is, is and you realize that it's about communication, you should probably give me a call. And so you tell them kind of what's missing from their context to value you. And guess what? They remember it and they call you back. And so even though you might you might call them back, the fact is, is by telling them what has to happen to them, when it happens, they remember. And so part of this is by understanding that context and the outcome and being able to wrap that into, you know what, you should call me back when these things happen. It works every time. And so that's the difference is we're trying to, as again, we're, we're and so they're actually willing to take our call when that has happened. But at the same time, the fact is when it does happen, they're willing to call us. You know, that's that's the difference. I love that. How do you, when, when you think about a lot of the, um, the, the, I don't know, quote unquote, standard mechanics that go along with the sales process, right? So yeah. you think about a, a campaign on the outbound side, you think about what an AE may do to kind of structure their, okay, well, I'm going to put this reminder in Salesforce that tells me that in three months I'm supposed to, yeah. like, do, do you look at from a tooling and process standpoint, intermixed with just kind of looking at things a little bit differently. So yeah. to, you know, to your example just now where it's, we're not waiting on three months from now, what we're really waiting on is something to happen. And specifically we're waiting on one or two or three things to happen. Yeah. Um, is that to you, do you see that as a mixture of the tools aren't bad, but you've got to change your lens a little bit, or is it, no, you, you need to change the way that you think about interaction patterns. So, so yeah, I, I, I'm, so first of all, like, the way that I'm training salespeople now is to actually identify the pushes, the pulls and anxieties and habits that they have to overcome through the sales process. Because if we know kind of like what, what paths there are available and why people finally buy our product, the fact is there's, there's not one, but probably two, three, four different pathways. And so if you can actually differentiate and start to understand what are the things pushing them, what are the things pulling them, what are the anxieties they have to overcome, and what's missing, like the thing is, is we actually have the set. And so you can start to get them to actually start to have conversations about, so what else is going on in the business? And we know if if this and this is going on in the business as well, it's like, oh, okay, that's part of one of the pushes is like, hey, we're in the midst of re, you know, we're in the midst of reorging uh, sales and marketing. Okay, well, that's a good sign that, that we could possibly use you. Okay. The other is, you know, we have a new sales leader. Well, that's another good sign because at some point they're looking for something new. Um, what are the outcomes? You know, it's like we need more metrics. We have to actually have that. So all of a sudden, as you start to lay out the 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 conversation, the conversation now becomes about them, as opposed to then talking about all your features and benefits. And so what we do is we train them to to first almost interrogate to understand where people are at, 
So then they know the four or five things to cover as the features and benefits that we can get to them, as opposed to the 200 features and benefits that we have that we just let them pick and choose from. Right. And so I think that's the big, the big difference is getting them to actually listen, ask questions and listen and being able to listen as opposed to know the product forwards and backwards and just literally, you know, like there are, I think of the salespeople who are numbers people. Like if I just get 25 calls in today, I do 25 calls a day and I literally do my pitch, I will, I, I, I can get to my numbers. And let's be clear, that works. But at the same time, the fact is, is it doesn't necessarily turn out the right results in terms of the right kinds of clients, or at some point it yeah. actually usually ends up discounting kind of what you can do because you get to the lowest combinator price that will fit. And my belief is the more you understand context, the fact is, is the same product can be worth more in different contexts than in another context. And that's where you start to actually realize that you're leaving money on the table. Yeah. That yeah. Is and, awesome. and you're not even taking away predictability um, per se or, or any of those things, right? I mean, the, the, a, a lot of the, the, the must haves from the sales team, right? It's not like those things suddenly disappear just because you're having those types of conversations. It just, to your, to your point, it may be volume goes down and average, you know, average deal value goes up, or right. it could be that, you know, so, um, so it's not like it's killing. I think sometimes sales folks are always so worried about, we, we can't, we can't consider a change like this because it's going to mess with the way we do sales, you know, and we're not going to be able to run the team anymore. And now I can't report up to my CEO and blah, blah, yeah. you know, it's like this, uh, <laughs> yep, yep. The, this, the seven stages kind of get laid out in, in 30 seconds, you know, and it's like, well, guys, no one's, no one's telling you that you have to remove predictability or that you have to remove the ability to even track any of this or to, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with even having a plan, but so, it's, it's the patterns, right? So here's the thing is, is what I would say is it's very predictable. It's just not yeah. predictable in time. And so this is where people are, are yeah. trying to say like, by this quarter, I have to have this number. And so part of it is to realize like at some point in time, we are working with predictability because it's like when we, we know that when A, B and C happen, they will buy it for this reason. And we know when C, D and E happen, they'll buy it for this other reason. And so part of it is to actually start to differentiate what are the reasons and what are the outcomes that they want and understanding that. And that's actually becomes very predictable. It's just not predictable necessarily in time and space. And so this is where, yep. to me, it's, it's, it's because we're slicing it by quarter, it's like, oh, this is what's happening. And you start to realize like, like time is not what people are worried about. The end of the quarter is not what people are worried about. Absolutely. How do you, how do you look at, uh, you know, so that's, that, that's kind of looking at, you know, the, the one thing about sales that I think everybody is, is that, is that very quarterly focus and, yes. you know, um, and of course that's incredibly tied to incentive structures, at least in a lot of places. Yes. Right. So, so much of the sales culture comes back to this idea that, yeah, but my numbers say X and that's tied to this period. How much of that for you do you see, like th how much of that has to change on the incentive side to get behaviors to be more of this, like, hey guys, this this is better for the organization in the, in the long term as well, but we need to keep these people operating in this way. Right, so this is where I've, I've, I've almost uh, broken up some of the metrics around it. So one is, instead of giving them all about sales commission of basically a closed deal, um, what I've done is I, I've actually uh, moved it where 25% is based on uh, discipline, action, kind of the process that they have on the front end of the sales process. 50% of it comes from close, and then another 25% comes from the, prog the, the customer making the progress. And so part of it is to make sure that they, because at some point in time, they, they, that way they're tied into making sure that they can actually have take the leads that marketing gives them and, and help convert. They can also make sure that customer success is successful along the way. And when you align it that way, it enables kind of it as opposed to just getting the close. That's really interesting. You, you, you talked about part of that incentive coming from the customer making progress. What yeah. does that give me an example of what that looks like? Um, you know, when, when, you know, you decide, okay, so, customers made progress. I'm, I'm awarding this, this percentage of the, yeah. Incentive. So, so part of it is, is like, so I work with a company called auto books and it's about basically they, they enable basically small uh, credit unions and, and I'll say larger banks to have PayPal type features. And so part of it is not only basically, you know, kind of going and doing demos and whatever and, and then getting the bank to agree, but then having, you know, a million dollars worth of revenue 
on the platform. So there's a lot of people who sell it, but then they don't actually adopt it very well. And so part of it is to make sure that the adoption is, is actually set up in the right way as well. And we found that when we align it that way, um, to be honest, they, they're pulling all the right people in at the demo at the demo stage to help people understand all the things, which then makes the onboarding and everything else way faster that all of a sudden change it. So they're almost making their demos harder, but at the same time, it's actually getting them to, to, to you know, the, the progress goal faster. And so it's enabling them to actually understand how to create the pull as opposed to having to push. Right. Do you see that as a, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, certainly from a B2B perspective, you know, you can have those, those nice conversations throughout the sales process with your customer to say, mm -hmm. or even your prospect, right? To say, yep. okay, we understand you. We understand where you're trying to go. We believe that we can help. Uh, achieve that progress through X, Y, Z. Yeah. When when you get into uh, more of a B two C situation, obviously yep. less less hand holding, less face to face, all that fun stuff. Yeah, in some cases, Are, do, but in some cases not. But yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So do you, do you feel that's still applying in the same way, or does it does it start to change a little bit? I'm just no, curious. I, I think it, I I really I think it's very situational, like everything. Yeah. But I think I think the the fact is if it's if it if it's just buying a car, it's like the notion of okay, you get you get a you get a commission if they buy another car. Like the, it's just too far of a gap in between. But it's yeah. that it's the notion of, for example, um that they make sure that they're filling out the the survey at the end. And that so it's not only that they get this, but it's like by enabling people to actually comment back, it enables them to actually kind of receive part of their commission. So it's like making sure you tie the whole thing in a bow as opposed to just getting all the commission based on just getting the clothes. Right. That so is it's, awesome. It's, so, yeah, so, no, be, Devin so for example, so I know, I know that I've talked to a, a car dealer and what they've done is they, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll end up giving like 90% of the commission uh, and then I'd save 10% of the commission based on the reviews that they get. Yeah. And so that way they're forced to make sure that they actually get those, the, the, that stuff done and everything else wrapped around it. Man, there's a lot of dealers uh, and salespeople that would probably struggle a little bit with that one. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> so, but but yeah. but but that's but yeah. but again, uh, to be honest, Fantastic. right now that's there's there's uh, there's fewer cars than there are people. They got people lining up. I mean, it, yeah. at some point in time, the customer service is actually more important right now because at some point they just can't walk in and buy it. They have to wait. And what's the waiting process look like? And how do you actually make sure that they don't feel like they're they're lost in the loop and they don't know what's going on and like there's a whole bunch of other things that are there. And so I, I feel like they, they have to modify. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I just, I, I even personally, I, I laugh about what I'm going through right now and thinking like, all right, so I, I, I know where that score would fall, you know? Right, right. Um, so now that's, that's, uh, that's, that's good stuff. And it definitely, I, I agree. I, there's definitely that situational element of, you know, in some cases, because there's an implementation onboarding, you know, rollout type period, there's all kinds of good stuff that you yeah. can apply from a progress perspective. And other, and other times, yeah, it's a little, it's a little chunkier and it's a little more of like, well, how do we still ensure that that engagement occurs? So Right. That makes well, sense. And, and if you yeah. think about it, what we're trying to do is that we think of a sale as like a moment in time. And what, what we're trying to say is like, no, there's a lot of things that go into getting to that moment in time. So how do we actually understand kind of the, 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 the way, how do they get there? And then once they buy, like, how do we make sure that this other part is there? So how do we actually get this, see sales as this bigger piece, not this really thin piece? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's why it's about the progress they're trying to make as opposed to, you know, the, the, the number of sales we made. We, um, you know, one of the things that <clears throat> Devin and I talk a lot about, particularly because we'll get kind of pulled into the more technical side as well, right? Which is systems, data, but it's the same exact yep. problem set, right? Which is there isn't this like, oh, well, sales uses this and that matters, but then marketing uses this and clients. It's like, well, it's the same customer. That that piece of data doesn't change just because a different group works with it. That's and right. It's the same thing, right? It's it's how do you how do you get those teams to treat it not as three distinct phases that have these like hard handoffs, but more of a customer could care less whether it's you know marketing or sales, client success, it's all the product company. team gets engaged. It's yeah, it's it's a logo, right? Well, um, well and that's yeah. and that's where I that's where I think the way that we've divided it up is it's almost like um, I'll say supply side gun, right? Like marketing's job is to generate leads. The more leads, the better, and and then and then sales will go like, I got a lot of leads, but they're garbage. And so all of a sudden you get people pointing mm -hmm. fingers at each other. And it's like, 
But once you actually motivate everybody to be aligned to helping people make progress, you realize that like, so when I built houses, we, you know, we were getting about a thousand leads a month. And to be honest, they were garbage. And I still got like 20 sales. And what I said is like, I want to change the process. So I get a hundred leads. And they're like, no, 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 you don't want to do that. We want to get 2000 leads. I'm like, no, I don't have the people to actually follow up on these leads. So I want to actually get better leads. And we went from a thousand leads to like 200 leads. And then we got, but we went from 20 closes to 80 closes. And so it's this notion of how do we actually align everybody? Because I, I like, even though you're generating more leads, it doesn't actually, it just creates more busy work for my salespeople. And so how do we actually understand how to actually let the, the, the marketing process generate that like almost have the speed bump that actually lets us know that they're ready. Right. And so there's, there's things you can do to align everybody. And then, and again, it's, how do we get the salespeople not to sell something that the the the, the uh, onboarding or the customer success people don't go like, oh my God, what did you sell, right? Like, how do we get them aligned? Because the friction, I, I feel like I'll say this, that there's more friction between marketing sales and customer success than there is in competition. They're more worried about each other than they are worried about competition. Oh, and so man. ultimately, how do we align the three of them to literally go like we together as a team, offense, defense, and special teams, how do we actually figure out how to actually learn how to compete against others as opposed to like spend all this energy and friction between ourselves? Oh man, that, that I have lived that. I have lived right? that. I felt that in my soul. When you oh, said that. <laughs> right. And, and it's, and it's one of those things where you you're like, well, we need to have a sit down meeting between marketing and sales. Cause there's friction between it's like, oh my gosh, like how, and, and, I appreciate it's there, but at some point, part of it is that's management's problem because they've misaligned everybody and they've put the wrong metrics in place, right? Clay and I would always talk about the fact is like, you know, what we usually measure what's easy, but not what's meaningful. And we have to be very careful that, that just because we can measure it, it actually then changes people's behavior. So we end up picking these metrics that actually are a lot of times the wrong metrics that don't actually drive the business. And they cause- have you conflict. found- have you found, um, you know, so when you think about even the soft transit, let, let's say that an organization is doing, doing a decent job of soft transitioning versus the hardcore marketing has like yeah. thrown it over the wall, never to yes. see it again. Yes. So let, let's say they're at least behaving, right? Yes. Um, but to your point, it's so much easier to attach to all the, all the usual quantitative metrics, right? It's, it's easy to attach to leads and conversion rates and MQLs that then turn into... Um, have, have you found that even in, in a transition from, say, marketing to outbound or from, from outbound to AEs, AEs yeah. to client yeah. care, all, all, the, all these kind of, e even in a good situation, soft transitions, have you found that there are less either less quantitative or at least um, um, different metrics that can be used that allow them to communicate in a way that that would actually allow the receiving group to push back a little bit and say hey like this this is not up to par like we i thank yeah. you marketing i appreciate that you labeled that but we're not going to accept this and, and waste our time with it yeah so so this is where so um the thing we talk about is anomalies like all all really innovative things come from anomalies. And so part of this is that what we want to do is take the time that when something is an anomaly to realize like, and it's like, we're not going to pursue this. We need to actually then have the moment to say like, why is it an anomaly? How do we actually understand what's about it? And then we don't want to actually assign it to, it's the process that's broken, not the people, right? <laughs> and so part of this is to take the time to really look at anomalies and say, is this something we have to adjust for? Is this something we're going to choose to ignore? And, and if we're going to choose to ignore it, how do we provide the feedback to, to, the, to the system before to actually enable it so it doesn't do that as opposed to just say, hey, stop doing that because they have a system that they have in place. And so part of it is when we, when we get that, we do a debrief around kind of what are the things that really worked? What are the things that didn't really work? Where are the anomalies that we have to make decisions about? And, and how do we actually modify the processes to improve the, 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 the flow as opposed to make the transitions just to, like I, I want it to be that there are no transitions. It's just a flow through the system. Yeah. Right? I'm a, again, I'm yeah. an engineer and this is this is like I would tell you in a million years, I never thought I'd ever write a book on sales. But when you bring a, uh, you know, a process orientation with the notion of jobs, uh, like a, the empathetic view of jobs to it, it like it makes sales almost like I like to do sales because now I get to help people as opposed to, oh, my God, I got to meet my quota. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And and. 
that is uh that's some you know when you you talk about that in the book it uh, i instantly connected with it because it was how i did sales i thought okay you know i, I used to sell yeah. computers you know before yeah. i got into to uh, into the design world i sold computers and um i you know my whole thing was i've got uh, a lot of times a, a a mom a dad you know coming in buying a computer for their family we're talking we're talking early 2000s here where you know people you know people have computers but it's starting to get to the point where everybody knows they have to have a computer in their house yep. um and so you've got people coming in where uh you know this is this is a big step for their family right right and they're right. they're they're trusting me to tell them what they really need, not try to just sell them something, right? But they don't really know what they need. And so they don't have the <laughs> language. They don't have, the, they, 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 all they know is they don't have this thing. And it's like, well, you know, and you start out with, well, how much RAM do you need? And how much hard drive do you need? And, and you start, and they're like, I don't even know what those words mean. So this is the difference between what I call supply side language and demand side language, right? And that, that, 90% of the people who are traditionally uh, traditional salespeople, they are taught the supply side language and their job is to educate the consumer about what they want, as opposed to understand what the customer wants and connect the outcome that they want with whatever feature they have. Like, but the notion of RAM, like to most average consumers, they don't know what it means. They don't even know what, how much they need. And all they do is they end up buying as much as they can afford. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And, <laughs> and that was, you know, my approach was, okay, I'm a computer nerd. I, I sold computers because I love computers. I was a computer yeah. nerd. I built computers as a hobby. Uh, uh, that's how I got my first job, all that stuff. So yeah. selling computers made sense, right? Yeah. Um, and I knew that they didn't know that stuff. Uh, and so I'm, I'm talking to them about, well, what do you want to do with it? What do you want to yeah. do with the computer? Exactly. And we get, we get, you know, through the, the sets of questions to understand how is this supposed to fit into your life? Mm -hmm. And then I say, hey, you don't need to go buy the $3,000 Sony Vio system on the end cap, okay? Yeah. You don't need that. <laughs> you just go buy you this little HP, you know, get this printer. You're going to be fine. Your yep. wife is going to be super mad at you that yeah. you bought the $3,000 computer that you guys will never, ever use mm -hmm. up to its potential. Yeah. Um, and, and I saw great, I, I saw great results from that. I would get, I would get thank yous from, from families. The, the, the other side of that is selling in a way where you're trying to get them to buy the highest ticket item, right? It, it, and, and they I, know again, it, like, by the way, they know it, they smell it, yeah. they see oh, it, they, it, it comes from a mile away. <clears throat> absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, so, and that's the, 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 the crux, I think of this method. And, you know, it's, again, I, I identified, I, I identified, that is as the way to do it almost instantly because I connected it with great results in my own career. But I, I still think I still think there's there's novelty to it in a sense because I see so many people doing it the old way. Yeah. And and, and so that's why I think it really is remarkable. Well, this is this is where Jason. So Jason was kind enough. Jason Fried was very kind to uh, Basecamp, uh, very kind to write the forward. And he talked about when he was 16 or 17, and he was a sneakerhead and you know, knew everything about it. And he realized like at some point in time, like I'm selling shoes, but nobody's buying what I'm laying down because they just want to, they want to put it on and try it and it's comfortable. And I'm telling them about the materials and, and they're not, I'm a kid, they don't know any different. And so it's realizing like at some point in time, I thought I knew how to sell. And then I realized yeah, yeah. that people were buying despite me, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the examples was as one of the things that base camp at the time was at like $39 a, a month. And one of the things we kept hearing was, I'm not sure how a, a piece of software for $39 a month can actually help me run my entire business. So one of the things we did is we, we took the next base camp and we took it up to $99 a month. And what was interesting was, is we, we thought it, we, we would have a, uh, people not hire it. And it turns out that we got a 20%, they got a, they got a 20% bump on top of it because now it became credible because price was actually a function of how good must it be to actually run my business. And so it's I one of those things where you start to think about, like, like at some point, raising your thing. Like, econ economics would say it should go down, but it didn't because the way we understood jobs to be done, we were able to actually not only increase revenue but increase number of units at the same time. 
And I remember being <clears throat> uh, starting a company, you know, right when Basecamp was kind of making yep. some of those changes. And I remember, and I'd even uh, like DHH way back, like with yeah. some Ruby stuff, like I had met him, but like, I, I, so I knew it's not like the company was foreign to me. Right. Yeah. And uh, I remember kind of getting with my partners and being like, listen, like, I think this will get the job done versus some of the other options. And yeah. it was like, well, like, really? Like, I know we're a startup, but that seems, that almost seems too far. And then the exactly. pricing changed. And like, I, as a consumer for that product, I remember thinking that, but the, like, you know, back to what was the progress part right. of it was, yes, we need a product that's going to be able to do X, Y, Z for us to run the company, right. you know, at this piece. But part of it too was we want to look legit. That's <laughs> right. And, and so it was almost like the emotional progress of looking legit was, was a little more important than even like, will right. this thing, because then it was a no brainer, like 40 bucks for a thing that does what the, you know, $400 thing does. Of course you, you do that. But it was also, right. do we, do we look legit? And do we feel like our people are going to feel like we went out right. and got something that was real, you know? So yep, yep, yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> you can't what funny. the shoes looked like from the top yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly or you care what you care what computer your neighbor bought just because you want to be able to say that you bought a slightly better one you're, you're never okay. going to turn it on anyway it doesn't that's matter right. <laughs> like, that's right that's right man. but, but oh, part man. Is, is to understand those things and people yeah, buy for emotional reasons and to realize the emotional buyer has a very different value code than than if you will the functional buyer or the you know, the, the person who's worried about doing something with it. And so you have to realize that those are real things, though they're very hard to distinguish. And if we treat them all as the same, then the reality is like at some point, they're, they're, we're going to have lots of variation. <laughs> hmm. Absolutely, man. So oh. I, 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 have, I have so many more questions, but I don't have uh, uh, so much time. I do want to make sure that we get into real quick yeah. What you what do you have on deck, man? I know, oh, I know you're yeah. probably working on working on another book. You so got we just I don't out. know if you've, I don't know if you uh, so I just launched a podcast. It's called The Circuit Breaker, which is a uh, it's about thirty minutes and it's about just taking a taking a step back, unplugging and and kind of uh, asking some questions that you probably should be asking yourself and listening to a banter between Greg and I, who's my business partner of seventeen years. I've got. Um, I got a book coming out in July called Learning to Build, which is uh, a homage to my four uh, uh, really, I've had many mentors, but I have four really dominant mentors who took what I would call as a dyslexic, illiterate kid of Detroit and basically poured their knowledge into me. And out of it, I've been able to work on over 3,500 products and services um, and innovate. And so it's these five skills that, that, that they taught me that enabled me to kind of really become a good innovator. Um, and then I just uh, signed a book uh, deal working with um, Harper Collins and uh, Michael Horn and Ethan Bernstein from the Harvard Business School um, around uh, hire your next job. And it's about applying jobs to basically the HR space of understanding what progress are your employees trying to make and really flipping the lens that saying that employees hire companies more than companies hire employees. And how do we actually understand the true progress they want to make? And you start to realize that it's way more than uh, uh, money and benefits, but it's also about challenge. It's also about you know mm -hmm. camaraderie. It's all about these social and emotional pieces that that um, you've got to actually start to take into account, especially in these economic times where there's more work than there are people. And um, my belief is that if we actually start to manage people by the progress they make and the progress they help the company make, we actually flip the lens as opposed to trying. So. One of the things that I had when I was a, a, a corporate person is that they would constantly tell me I need to work on my communication and my spelling. Well, as a dyslexic, of course, that's going to be my, my, my problem. But they never actually told me what I was good at and just had me spend all my time working on what I sucked at. And the moment that I've kind of finally said, all right, look, I'm going to fess up to what the problem is, all of a sudden life became 10 times easier. And so part of this is to realize, like, how do you know what you're good at? How do you know what you suck at? And how do you go find work that lets you do more of the stuff you love to do and less of the stuff you hate to do? <laughs> that is awesome. I love that. So, uh, that those, are the, well, those are the three projects. Oh, and I got some software coming as well uh, on jobs to be done as well. So the, yeah. the pandemic caused me to kind of uh, <laughs> take a step back and build some more. And, and I'm really I'm enjoying that. So uh, between books and software and different, different uh, uh, writings, uh, I'm building a class or two as well. So. That is awesome, man. I, I love it. I love it. I, I will I will definitely be first first in line to buy them all. Uh, Thank and you. Uh, sounds like we have 
we have plenty more excuses to have you back on the show oh, and yeah. talk about your new stuff, man. Uh, always. If there's any, like, uh, to be honest, love to be the sounding board. Uh, just let me know if uh, there's anything. I, <laughs> to be honest, that's how I find my next topic is to always find a struggling moment that uh, kind of, that's how I got to the HR side is, is just looking at how hard it is to find your next job and to realize how many people struggle and want a new job, but don't actually know how to find it. And so we built a process wrapped around that. So Man. anything Man. you struggle with, uh, let's pull me in. That's what I want to do. That's what, the anomalies is where innovation lies. Well, I love that, so. man. I think, uh, I think we will definitely do that. Uh, I have, I have all kinds of ideas swirling in my head. Um, Good. I, I want to real quick, just kind of recap for people. We, we covered some great points on sales today. I think that uh, there, there are some huge uh, sort of thoughts here for me. One, uh, is obviously the incentive structure. Stop measuring stuff that doesn't actually mean anything. Stop yeah. doing things just because it's the way it's always been done. T make sure that you put your metrics in place in a way that allows your team to work together to actually get the outcomes that you want. Uh, two, stop selling and start helping. Start helping people make progress. Uh, I love uh, that you make that point, Bob. I love that it's a way for people to make a small but very important mental pivot to be able to think about what they're actually doing in that moment. And it is not making a, a commission. It's not making a number. It's about helping somebody make progress in their life. Um, folks, I, I really thank you for listening. Bob, thank Thanks you for so me. much for being Thanks, on man. the show, man. And uh, Good to see folks, you both. I, Thanks, I uh, am Bye. really looking forward to having you back on. Ladies and gentlemen, keep out serving your competition on your relentless pursuit to become an experienced leader. Thanks for listening.